Welcome to lesson number 11, Waging Love. Once again, we're continuing with the book of Isaiah. Only a couple of lessons left, and we're going into a new quarter already. Once again, Brian, thank you for joining the program and chatting to us about the lesson. Well, it's uh, truly a blessing to be on the program with you, Rene, and welcome to all the viewers and subscribers. Uh, these are truly art stirring messages. Let us pray as we begin our study. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can once again call upon your name. We come to you through Jesus, our Savior, who loves us, who gave himself for us, and who ever lives to intercede for us. And we thank you that your plan, your mission is to save all mankind. And ours is to choose whether we will allow Christ to live within us and to help us and guide us and lead us into reflecting your glory. Bless us with your spirit and bless each viewer. Bless Ranir and myself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Our theme text is Isaiah 5810, a popular chapter in Isaiah, probably the most popular chapters of 53 and 58. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as noonday. Powerful mm. lesson today. We're going to learn a lot again. Isaiah chapter 55 up to 58 is our study. And on Sunday, it talks about buy something for free. Now, how in mm. the world do you buy something for free? Even Is it even possible in today's day and age? And the answer is no. But sometimes, you know, if you go onto Facebook, let's say you go onto the Golf Hub store or you go onto whatever store it is on Facebook, sometimes you have someone there saying, free. There's an item at my house. I don't even want to sell it. Come and fetch it. But you're not buying it. You're going to collect a gift, a free item. Mm. But the Bible talks mm. about buying something for free probably the only place in the world that you find something like this, something of value that costs infinite value for free and you're buying it. Let's go to Isaiah 55 and verse one. Isaiah 55 and verse one. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to to waters and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Now, Brian, is this a contradiction? How can you, in, in business terms, I mean, you're a businessman. That is a contradiction in your business world. <laughs> if a customer would yeah, phone you, good. Brian, I need um, oil transported to Zimbabwe. I'll buy it from you and you give it to me for free. <laughs> um, you'll probably say, I think you phoned the wrong transporting company yeah, and that's a paradox there <laughs> so so brian explain to us what does this mean <laughs> how does it work yeah so this is a, a paradoxical statement but um, that's the beauty of god and his love jesus and his love for us because we cannot save ourselves. I mean, we, 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 we see here it's talking, of course, um, you know, in a way where it's giving an example. Um, trying to think of the word for it, but um, that's not important right now. It's um, those who are thirsty, come to waters. Uh, those who are hungry, come and buy. I mean, uh, it's, someone can't come up to a restaurant and buy any food or drink if they don't have money. I remember the one time I went to buy some supplies and when I got to the store and I walked in and I, you know, picked up my goods, when I got the counter, I realized I left my wallet at home, mm. not even in the car. So I had to put the goods back down. I needed them. I had to drive all the way back home, get my wallet, go back and then buy. But here we find that um, God refers to this which is so beautiful, Renier, because there are symbols employed here. And if you think about it, Jesus himself used that word, you know, let him that is a thirsty come unto me 
and I will give him living waters. I used that with the lady at the Samaritan well, the last book in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, 17. Those who are thirsty, let him come unto the river, you know, and drink of the fountain of life. Um, so Jesus called himself um, the water of life. He says, if you drink of this water, you shall not thirst again. So as we look at this statement here, I mean, when you think about um, coming to buy, it speaks of wine and milk. I mean, wine in the Bible, according to Matthew 9, 17, is teaching uh, God's word. Milk, um, we find there in Hebrews 5, verse 12, 1 Peter 2, verse 2, speaks of desire, the sincere milk of the word, Peter calls it. Mm. So, so, so it's God's word. It's God's truth. Um, and these are things that are not perishable. I mean, you can't buy them with silver and gold, as, as Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verse 8 and 19, our, our next text. But we, we come to him who has inexhaustible supplies. So, so I believe this is a wonderful analogy of God's grace in supplying our needs because we can't live without water. I mean, water is one of the most precious commodities in our bodies made up of at least about 70 to 80% water. I mean, you, you, you cannot live without water. You can't live without bread. And, and, and Lord is saying, come, I will supply this to you. And that's the beauty of it. He says, come and buy. There's a responsibility on your shoulders. Right. There is no, you don't just sit back and receive the gift. And I think that's a difference between you receiving the gift and buying a free gift. There is mm. responsibility. You need to do something. Um, if, if it's my birthday, um, then my wife normally makes, you know, nice special things and there's gifts hidden away in the house. And my son gets so excited. Normally all the gifts are treats that I like to eat. You know, go and look at your car. It's like, like last year, it was like this clue. One clue led to the next and you had to figure out where in the house. And it was so exciting and because all my favorite treats, my favorite nuts and chips, etc. And that is something that someone gave to me. I had to do nothing. I wasn't mm. responsible for my birth. Therefore, I'm not responsible for my birthday. As in, it's not my responsibility to do something. It just naturally comes every year on the 9th of April. But when God says, come and buy something free, he's saying you've got the responsibility to come and respond to the oh. invitation of salvation. You need to mm -hmm. come and what the practical steps that is laid out in the sanctuary and in the rest of the Bible is you need to realize your need, confess your sins and accept the gift of salvation. It's all free, but you still have to do something. That's the buying part. The free part is that Christ already bought you with a price. He already mm -hmm. paid the price for your salvation. Therefore, never ever will there be debt recorded to your name. If heaven were to come and ask you for your salvational liabilities, there is none because Christ paid mm -hmm. it. There are only assets. And once again, Christ is the asset. I mean, how can you lose? This is a brilliant business transaction, Brian. You gain everything, stand to lose nothing because what, have, what Christ has done. What an amazing gift that you can buy. And Absolutely. So again, we can we can understand now when Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, "Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, mm. and I will give you rest." Uh, and of course, he says, "Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly." So, so, so as we study this this chapter here, um, it's a, a chapter of repentance, revival, and reformation. I, I just love the themes as they came out. And, 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 and only Christ supplied it. Again, he says, right there in Isaiah chapter 1, we read that in verses 18, you know, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Um, though they be red like crimson. So, so, so we got to come to him. And, and when we come to him, he says, to him who comes to me, I will in no wise cast aside. I mean, there are a lot of poor people in the world. I mean, really poverty stricken. They cannot even have any money to go and buy anything. Yet God says, you know, um, look at the sparrows. You know, they don't toil. They don't spin, but your heavenly father feeds them. The lilies of the field. You know, God supplies all of our needs 
according to his riches in glory, which we can never exhaust. Our heavenly mm. father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we don't even know any. So, you know, I just love this fact here that um, salvation is not for the elite, for the educated, for the wealthy. Salvation is for all people. He says, I'm not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance and be saved. Mm. So, you know, when it comes to our salvation, as you mentioned, it is a pool of inexhaustible supplies that God wants to give us. And our response is to come and then to cooperate with him. Amen. First Peter 1, 18 and 19. Let's read it. First Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So this mm. price has yeah. not been paid by silver or gold, but it's been paid by the blood. Right. Of Christ. And this is the price we refer to that was paid already in the first six, section of, of our study. So mm. we've basically covered the second question already on Sunday's part. Now, sure. how does this approach compare to what the New Testament says in Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 that says, by grace have you been saved through faith, not of yourselves, and not of works, lest that any man should boast. Mm. Brian, how can we compare these two, what Isaiah 55, 1 says, with Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? They are so in harmony with each other because, um, of course, Paul is writing after the Messiah has come and paid the sacrifice for the sins. And, of course, Isaiah is looking forward and pointing to the Messiah and points him out very clearly in verses in chapter 53, the role of the Messiah that he would be wounded for our transgressions. He would pay the price for our sins. he would be cut off for us. And when we come to Isaiah 58, um, we look at the practicality of godly religion. Uh, mm -hmm. Isaiah 59 speaks of, you know, the, the attitude of the priests and the religious leaders. And chapter 60, of course, that we know quite well, would be the mission of the Messiah to set the captives free and to let those who are oppressed and those who are at liberty. So, so Rene, as we look at Paul's analogy, uh, he's saying, and it's beautiful, we are saved by grace. What is grace? Grace is the act of God to put on our behalf, to pay on our behalf, the supreme sacrifice of his son. I mean, that is grace. Um, some people say unmerited favor. It's much more than unmerited mm -hmm. favor. It is God doing everything for us that we cannot do for us. And that's why he says in the next statement, and not of yourselves, right? And not of works. I mean, if it was of works, there would be a lot of boasting. But here he says, it's through faith. And so the gift of God is received by faith. And faith is something the Bible says in Romans, um, God has given a measure of faith unto every man. That's Romans chapter 12, I think, verse 3. But anyhow, somewhere in chapter 12. So, so we all have faith. God has given us something. What we do with it, if we, if we trade and buy, uh, as it is there, you know, in the parable of the, 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 the talent, that God through 13 onwards, uh, the, the, the ones that traded, what God gave them, the talents. And of course, our talents is time, means, our abilities, and a lot more. Um, it's only as we use God's gifts that is given to us anyhow, that we can increase in our favor and our standing with God. You know, it's interesting that here in the gray part at the bottom, you know, they say salvation is free, but yet it costs you something. Yeah. And this is not in relation to the buying part. The buying part is you now accepting the gift by faith, as Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, by mm. faith have you been saved. But it's rather the surrender of those things that are contrary to the will of God that I need to give up. Right. Sure. It is a total surrender of the life to God. And sometimes it does cost something. You might be a martyr mm. for the gospel. Mm. You might lose a lot of friends which many of us have, you might lose that, that one that you thought would become your spouse, a boyfriend or a girlfriend for the gospel's sake. But Jesus promises us nothing that we've given up in this world, whether lands, brothers, sisters, 
money, etc., will not be given a hundredfold, and listen to what Christ says, in this life and in the life to come. We many life times think that God's blessings only restored for, uh, kept for the heaven, but it's not just kept for God wants to restore it here. What you've given up in this world, God wants to bless you for it in this world. What it looks like, let him decide. He knows what is best and that will keep you in his hands until the day we enter the kingdom. Monday's part. Hi. Yeah, just before we go on, yes. Neil, just before we go on, just a quick one. Um, I thought of this. It just said, he who finds his life shall lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake shall gain it. So, so there's, the, there's our response. As you mentioned, we surrender, we, we sacrifice um, in, the, in the giving, surrendering of our lives to God. And when we give to him, what do we give him? We give a life that is filled with selfishness, pride, mm -hmm. sin. And what does he do in exchange for us? He cleanses us, gives us life, his spirit, and eternal life in the life to come. I mean, what a wonderful exchange that is. If I were to think about where I was before I was a Christian, just in natural things like what I drove, where I lived, what I even looked like, you know, no girlfriend at that stage, nothing. To where I am today, wife, children, what I drive, where I live. God has just showed that I can do much more for you. If you now these are materials, are not my my wife and my children, but you know, cars, where you live, etc. These are material type of things. But even in that, God says, "I'll bless you to further my kingdom, to do my work. I will bless you." And that's where we come mm -hmm. to Monday when He says, "My thoughts, my ways are not your thoughts and not your ways." We need to submit to God's ways. Now, why did God say this here in Isaiah fifty-five? Why does He transition to now to say? My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. In the context of Isaiah 55. So this is a key uh, question here, Renil, because we find it's in response to the fact that Israel were at this stage a nation that were idolatrous. They had disobeyed the commands of God and already on the horizon they were going to be captive, Babylon. Uh, the decline spiritually of the nation, and you know when we decline spiritually, we also decline in terms of our material possessions, in terms of our health, in terms of our mental and physical. Um, it's a natural progression. It's a consequence of disobedience. The Bible says the way of the transgressor, those who want to remain in sin is hard. But, but those who come to the Lord, he says, my peace I give unto thee. So, so when you think about this here, God is saying that, you know what? If you come to me, seek the Lord while he may be found. Uh, he says, call upon me and I will answer. Uh, but we need to forsake our ways. And we need to have in thought in mind a desire for God's righteousness. Um, his love and mercy. And then he says, then I will abundantly pardon. You know, I like the use of that word, abundantly pardon. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Paul puts it this way here. Um, where grace, where, where, where sin does abound, mm -hmm. grace does much Amen. more abound. So, so, you know, you just gave an, a, an analogy of your past life uh, when you were living in sin. And, and, and Paul says, and such were some of you. We all have uh, baggage of selfishness and pride and sinfulness and uh, pleasures of this world. I mean, that, that's just the human nature. But when we come to the Lord, he says, when you seek the Lord while he may be found and call on him, once you're willing to forsake, God's going to give you and I the, the strength. So, so his thoughts are higher than ours because he wants to elevate us to be in the high place on the earth. He wants us to have hope, peace, love, these are qualities or characters, traits we cannot buy. I mean, the, money cannot buy these things. They are learned in the school of humility, obedience, and submissive to God's will. And, 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 and you know, when I look at my life, Renir, uh, I've got a lot of things that I regret that I did. I, I was brought up in a, an Adventist home. Um, my dad and mom were wonderful examples to all of us, eight in our family. But when I became a young man and I, I left school, you know, I, I drifted out there. I, I never left the church, but I got involved in questionable things. The music I listened to, 
the, mm. the, the rock and reggae and all that kind of stuff. That was totally taking me down a path of self-destruction. And, and so I'm ashamed of some of the things I did and listened to. But I praise God that he brought me back. I, mm. I, I, I got to the place where I said, okay, this life of sin is not for me. And God said, if you come to me, Brian, says, come unto me and I will, I will heal your mm. backsliding. Uh, come unto me and I will forgive your sins. And, and that's what we find in God. It doesn't matter how far down the drain or down the ladder of destruction uh, we've gone. God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, my ways, because I have a plan and a purpose for you that you cannot begin to imagine that this world can ever offer to you. Amen. God does a wonderful work in all of us. We all need to find mm -hmm. Christ. No matter if we were brought up in the church, doesn't matter what happens. We need to find Christ for ourselves. And then the transformation mm -hmm. will happen within. I read to you the yes. spirit of prophecy, my life today, page 360. The theme of redemption is one that angels desire to look in. It will be the science and the song of the redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Is it not worthy of careful thought and study now? The subject mm. is inexhaustible. The study of the incarnation of Christ, his anointing sacrifice and meditorial work will employ the mind of the diligent student as long as time shall last. And looking to heaven with its unnumbered years, you will exclaim, great is the mystery of godliness. Mm. You know, Brian, this... this um, Current weekend, you know, our study is pre-recorded, but this current weekend that's coming up now, um, I'm presenting a series in Amanda and Toti. It's a new one that God has really inspired about our different temperaments and personalities and how similar we actually are when it comes to these things that it just has been given over, you know, from Adam and Eve right up to our day. And then the beauty of how God wants to strengthen our strengths and give us victory over our weaknesses mm. and how Amen. we did it in the Bible and the mystery of that plan. is just, it just fascinates me so much. And I'm looking so much forward to present this and because I'm learning myself mm. and it's just wonderful what God wants to do in his people and how he wants to do it. It is amazing that God that did it in the old Testament and in the new Testament is still doing it in us today. So, no. Rene, before you go on, just quickly, uh, I, I love verse 10 says uh, that he's going to give us seed mm. and, and mm. water um, to water the seed uh, that it might produce bread. So yes. when you think about the Holy Spirit watering the seed, God's word, you know, Jesus spoke about the soul that goes out to sow the seed and said the seed is the word of God. So, so unless the Holy Spirit brings to your mind and, and my mind, um, where our lives are out of harmony, out of sync with God's will, because we, we all are on different portions of the ladder mm -hmm. and we are all a work in progress. Some of us, God has done much to, uh, you know, transform. Others of us still, are still working on, you know, uh, other areas. But, but it says it produces bread uh, for the eater. <laughs> and, and Jesus said, unless you eat this bread, he says, I am the bread of life. Unless we internalize it, you know, these are wonderful studies, but if we're not applying them in our lives, if God's word is not trans, then God is information. And, you know, and you can go on the internet, get lots of information, but that, that information must lead, that knowledge must lead to a wisdom where we apply God's word. And then he says, so, so shall my word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall accomplish that which I uh, intend it to. So God's word is to, Paul, uh, David says, how shall a young man cleanse himself from his ways by taking heed there according to thy word? So unless we, we applying this principle that we are learning from these beautiful studies and asking God's word to transform us, you know, we will still find ourselves asking for forgiveness again and again for the same besetting sins instead mm -hmm. of finding victory and climbing on the ladder of grace that uh, Peter speaks of. Add unto virtue knowledge and add unto mm -hmm. knowledge, you know, um, Peter's ladder. Anyhow, um, I just thought I'll add that in there for our Amen. section for Monday. Thank you very much, Brian. Tuesday's part, Fast Friends, based upon Isaiah 58, 8 through 1, where it says that we talk about this fast. You know, mm. what is this fast? You know, even the Israelites had a wrong, or especially the Pharisees had a wrong perception of what this fast entails. 
Mm. And in Isaiah 58, you know, verse one, a very popular verse evangelist use it, you know, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell yeah. my people their transgressions. But verse three, I want us to read together. Verse three says, why have we fasted, they say, and mm. you have not seen, you know, what, what about our works, God? Why are you not seeing it? Why have we afflicted our souls and you have not taken notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Now, Brian, what is this fast to refer, referring to here in verse three? What, what's happening here? So we see uh, the life of Israel at this stage uh, was one of outside um, works. What can I use a better term? In other words, their lives were so caught up in ceremonies and rituals and what was taking on in the temple. Every single ritual sacrifice, every feast pointed to the work of Christ to transform and change the life of the believer. But theirs was an outward mm. performance. Um, and that's why Isaiah says, rend not your garments, but your hearts. Mm. So, so outwardly, I mean, they could fast. Uh, they could quote from the Torah. Outwardly, they knew everything about what happened at the feast and how to perform the ceremonies. But their hearts, they were not treating people well. I mean, they were oppressing their laborers. Um, they were not uh, fair to the widows and the poor. Um, they gave favor. They were partial in how they treated the rich. And of course, they had a wrong conception, uh, conception completely that if you're rich, um, then you are favored of God. And if you're poor, then you are cursed. Well, you know, Jesus came from a poor family. And that's why they didn't like the Messiah. They were looking for a Messiah that would bring riches and honor and glory and majesty and power and might. They were not looking for a spiritual kingdom. So, so here is referred to Renir. God is saying all your outward ceremonies, all your mm -hmm. confessions of faith, no matter what you do, if that does not lead to how you treat people, mm -hmm. how you feed the hungry, how you take care of the poor, how you not hide yourself from those who are in need. If you are not transformed by my word, then all that fasting, all that reciting of the Torah, is absolutely rubbish. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly the, what Isaiah is trying to say in, in verse 4. Mm. The Bible says, Indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and to strike mm. with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast yeah. as you do this day, to make your voice heard on high. You think about it this way. If you were to ask the Jews, you know, what is the most popular verse in the Old Testament, they probably refer to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know, our Lord, our God, He is one. Love God with all your heart and all your soul. And mm. this is what they were trying to live out in their fasting. You know, I'm fasting. I'm in sackcloth and ashes. I'm, I'm in front of God and, and I'm doing all these ceremonies. I'm keeping to the rules. I'm doing whatever is right. But what they did not understand, and many of us do not understand today, that this True. connection with God, loving God with all your heart and all your soul, will always result in Loving your neighbor as yourself. Mm, you right. treat your neighbor differently. We saw it in sure. the Old Testament. They were not doing it. And we see it today amongst the Pharisees, our brethren here in the church, that they would have these rules. I am a vegan. I dress correctly. I don't listen to this music. I don't watch these movies, mm. etc. Doing all these right things because they want to please God and do what is right in God's sight. But yet they treat their fellow brother and sister like dirt. They don't love them. They don't have a heart to save. They don't have a heart to, to reach out to people. And therefore, the loving God of all your heart and soul, that connection, that fast is based upon what Isaiah is warning against here. And right. then God explains what this fast needs to look like. Yes. He explains what it needs to look like. And we get to Wednesday's part, the fast fight. Mm. And here God tells us what it needs to look like. This is the result of the connection with God. Isaiah 58, 6 and 7. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? But let me put it into the words I've tried to explain. Is this not the, the result of your connection with me? To lose the bonds of wickedness. 
to undo the heavy burdens, because this is what Christ did when he came to the earth. This is what Isaiah said he would come and do. To let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. God is saying, is this not what, what is supposed to be the result of your connection with me? No. Brian, how, how do you understand this, this fast that God is asking of his people? So as, as I read this year and prayed about it and studied uh, Renier, I, I found that there's seven uh, attributes they mentioned there. And, 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 and unless we have the spirit of Christ in us to reach out to people, when you think about loosing the bonds of wickedness, I mean, uh, they were a wicked nation and that's why they were going into literal bondage. Hmm. But it is because their spiritual connection with God was severed um, so, so, so their spiritual bondage was even worse and that led to their literal uh, bondage. When you think of undoing the heavy burdens, uh, exploiting their laborers, um, what were they doing? They were oppressing people. Um, they were not sharing their bread with the hungry. They were not interested in the poor and the, the poor were actually shut out. Um, and they would not clothe them. I mean, when you look at Clothing the naked, when you think about that, uh, I think of uh, Zechariah chapter 3, uh, where mm. Joshua the high priest, you know, is standing there and Satan is accusing him. And, and God says, he rebukes the devil and he says, is not this a brand that I've plucked out of the fire? And he says, go and take those clothes, those filthy garments from him and give him a new raiment, a mm. change of garments, the righteousness of Christ. So when we have the righteousness of Christ, we will not hide ourselves from our brethren. We will have a desire to bless others because that's the mission of Jesus. Mm. He came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come to be coronated as the, 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 the son of David ruling on an earthly throne, but rather a spiritual throne. And he is that throne. He is that rock. So, Rene, you know, when, when I looked at it, I said, wow. Chapter 6 to, um, verses 6 to 10 consists of a revival of practical godliness. This is what we're reading. I mean, mm. if we have this practical godliness, it shows that we have come encounter with the God who says, come unto me, come mm. by without money. And if you are willing to surrender your life to me, that, that's the, that's the trade-off. I, I have bought you with a price. It's, 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 it's imperishable. It's uh, not like silver and gold that perishes. Uh, but here is the serious, serious um, uh, change here. The transformation leads now to the reform, which we find in verses 13, where God says, okay, these people will honor me. They will keep my Sabbath. They will find me to be a delight. And I will now honor them. I will cause them to walk on the high place of the earth. So that you're talking about, you know, a hundredfold in this life and eternal life to come. Mm. So God offers us far more, in exponentially far more, then what the devil can offer us. I mean, the devil offered Christ all the kingdoms of this world. He says, if only you'll bow down for me, I'll give them to you. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to go down that road of self-denial. I'll give them to you. And of course, how he showed them, we don't know. The devil can show us uh, in a, a marvelous way the wonderful things. This, let's not uh, get down. There is a pleasure in sin. Uh, it says Moses forsook the pleasures of Egypt, which were for a season, and he esteemed the, the riches and approaches of God's people more than things that were perishable. So, mm. so we think about God's desires. Okay, you may not be rich in the goods of this world, but you're going to be rich in faith, in love, and you're going to have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Now, now most people who are rich, they don't have that. There are few that are rich, right, in the goods of this world the Abrahams of this world and the Jobs of this world, where they are faithful to God. And so they have both. But generally speaking, rich people, that's why God said, you know, how hard is it for a rich man to end the kingdom? Most rich people are more concerned about what's in the bank balance, mm -hmm. the cars they drive, the homes they have, what they wear and all their gadgets and all the, you know, associations with people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, those things are only for now. When you think about what God if we will give him our lives, he says, I'll give you that which you cannot buy in this life. And, and, and that's, that's, that's what 
the result of the studies. I, I won't say more on that. Let's let's look at the the further uh, study there as we get to the end of the chapter. So God said to them, "Is this not the fast that I've spoken to you about? What you need to do?" Mm-hmm. And I like the progression through. Um, the book of Isaiah. It's like God rebukes his people and then he says, Isaiah 9, Jesus is coming. He says more things than Isaiah 11. He says more things, Isaiah 41, 42. You can go through it. And the Messiah, Mm -hmm. every time is the example of what God is expecting of his people. Then here in Isaiah 58, he's saying, is this not the fast that I want? And then Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to yeah, preach yeah. good tidings to the poor, to heal the broken. So like God's saying, this is what the Messiah is coming to do. Emulate yeah. the Messiah. Do what the Messiah is going to do. And it's totally different from your understanding. To be so That's ritual right. and obey God and hitting your neighbor with your fist is not religion. <laughs> it's a different spirit. That's what God is trying to say to his people. And we see, still see it today, unfortunately, in the church. Maybe not hitting with the fist, but with our words, our action, our rejection of God's people, etc. Our last part of the study is a time for us, which is the Sabbath, verse 13 and 14. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 58, 13 and 14. Like that title, a time for us. Yes. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, the mouth of the Lord have spoken. Now this is a powerful text. Mm. Brian, what kind of day is the Sabbath supposed to be for us in relation to these texts? So, Renir, I just lo- I love the way how um, Isaiah puts it there. And, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord. Uh, so it reminded me of a text in Psalm 40, verse 8, I believe it is. Um, and it applied to Jesus. It says, I delight to do thy, 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 law, thy word, O Lord. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Mm. So, so if, if we do, delight to do the word, the way of the Lord, we will find in obedience um, the highest form of worship. And we will find that being obedient to God's law brings to us a rest and a peace that this world can never, ever offer we cannot buy it. God gives it to us as a result of our fulfilling the conditions of his word. And, and what is the condition, uh, Renil? He says, do not, if you take your foot away from trampling upon the Sabbath. So, so clearly in Isaiah's time, and so it was the time of Jeremiah, and they both are contemporary prophets. Uh, Jeremiah said in, in chapter 25, you know, if, if you will stop buying and selling on the Sabbath day um, and will honor the Sabbath, he says, then I will honor you and the kings of this uh, city, Jerusalem, will remain on the throne and nations will come to it. But he says, if you do not, I will destroy and burn the city with fire. Sadly, that's exactly what happened. Babylon came and destroyed the city with fire because they trampled upon the Sabbath. So, so God's saying, listen, you're trampling upon my Sabbath. How am I trampling on Sabbath? Well, you're doing your own pleasure. They were buying and selling in the time of Jeremiah. They were buying the time of the, even in the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah had to shut the gates <laughs> and said to them, if I see these merchants come, I will lay hands on you. I will physically remove you from the gates. <laughs> mm. Now, I'm sure he wouldn't have fisted them, but I mean, he would have just said, listen, guys, uh, take care of these people here. They are desecrating the Sabbath. But the point is, they trample upon the Sabbath. How? And we need to be careful. Uh, sometimes I need to remind myself on the Sabbath, not speaking your own words. The, the, the Sabbath is not for speaking about your business. The Sabbath is not for speaking about sporting activities or what you're going to do on Sunday, uh, unless it's in connection with ministry. Because uh, in Matthew 25, 40, Jesus says to those on the right hand side, you have given the, the hungry bread to eat, the thirsty water to drink. You have taken the stranger into your house. You have clothed the naked and you visit those who are sick and in prison 
And, and um, he said, in as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. So Renita, I was thinking about this as I was studying, you know, uh, too often on Sabbath, yeah, we go on nature walks, that's really nice. I mean, that's part of Sabbath observance. Mm. And sometimes we go to church activities, that's really nice. And sometimes we can read, sometimes I'll prepare even for a, a sermon. Uh, I'm, I might be preaching next week on a Sabbath afternoon. Um, and all these things are good. But how often do we actually go and visit the sick? You know, there was a time I used to go to the hospital and visit people and, and hand out tracts. And I really enjoyed that. But somehow that's kind of like just fizzled away. Um, how is it about going to take care of the, the poor? I mean, Jesus did acts of mercy on the Sabbath. He says, the Sabbath was made for men. Why? Because it is good. It is lawful to be good on the Sabbath. So, so he says, it's my holy day. It's not your day, Brian. So leave out all your thoughts, all your words, and even what you're doing for another day. Focus on me, on my words, on nature, on people, and, and spend time with your family. That's important. Family time is good. Nature time is good. So, you know, I, I came up with seven, seven things again from that one text. Don't trample the Sabbath. Not doing your own pleasure on my holy day. Call the Sabbath a delight. Honor him, um, and that's, that's actually the acid test. What are we doing on Sabbath? Is it honoring God? I mean, that's the principle. It's timeless. If what I'm doing is honoring God, if I'm going, helping out the poor, if I'm visiting the sick, if I'm out in nature, whatever I'm doing, if it's honoring God, then I'm fulfilling the plan of the Sabbath. But we are called to be what? Repairers of the breach. I mean, there's so much. I can preach on that one sermon, but I'm going to... Give it over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian. There is so much in it. The Sabbath is a day for self-denial and social kindness. Mm. I like what the lesson is saying about that. It's a day right, to honor God right. and to honor your neighbor, to spend time with friends and family, mm. to reach out to the lost. Correct. It's a wonderful day. And I like the promise in the text. And it says, I will cause you to ride on the hills of the earth, the high hills of the earth. Meaning so many people are missing out on this day. Amen. Because even Adventists are missing out because for them it's a lay day. You know, lay activities. Yeah. Let's let's sleep in and um, just, you know, go to church and then sleep for the rest of the day until the sun sets. And then, then I'll come out and do something. It's a day really that God has blessed so that we can bless others. I'm not saying we need to do evangelism every yes. Sabbath and go to the hospitals and right. etc. every single Sabbath. But surely no. inside of our hearts, not there it. must be a burning to have the fast that Isaiah 58 is talking about. To lose the bonds of Amen. wickedness, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to do something to the glory of God because of my connection with the Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus mm. Christ. Brian, thanks so much for your time in this lesson. For the viewers, may God richly bless you. May we, may we have the Messiah in our hearts through the Holy Spirit and do those things that Christ did through the power yes. of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray mm. together before we end our lesson. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this lesson. Thank you so much for the book of Isaiah that tells us so much about the Messiah. I pray, Father, that we would have the Holy Spirit and do those things that you require of us. Not because we want to be saved, but because we are saved and have a living relationship yes. with you. We pray Amen. this in Jesus' name. Amen.